weekly lecture. I'll give you a brief introduction to the Varahamera Science Forum. I'll hand it over to Ramanan for an introduction to the speaker. Then the speaker will give the lecture for the day, after which we'll have a brief question and answer session. You can find all our programs on our website, varahamehirasf.blogspot.com. The Smosco board of pictures that you're seeing is the invitations that we made for past lectures. All our lectures are available as videos on YouTube in our channel. We are uh, in major social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Just search for Varah Mehra Science Forum in all of these, and you will uh, we'll be the topmost result in these things. Uh, we also have a couple of WhatsApp groups. You can send your number to us. You can message us. Uh, any of the three people here are admins. Uh, we can add you to the WhatsApp group if you want to join and have discussions. We discuss all things science, basically, not just uh, uh, the Varaha Vera Science Forum lectures. We also have an events notification group. So if you want to be notified by WhatsApp of these events, you can just message us on these one of these numbers. Um, we started this forum a few years back uh, to, you know, especially today in light of the chess program, uh, very culturally interesting programs have been uh, happening all over Madras. And one thing we wanted to add was uh, science lectures to that. We do have some science lectures, but they are generally targeted at a very technical audience. We have very few popular lectures. So we wanted to be a forum where we could have that, uh, not just have seminars at medical colleges and you know hospitals and stuff like that. So that's why this forum. Uh, we've had quite a few lectures. Uh, in fact, I think we are completing our fifth year with this lecture and stepping into the sixth year next, uh, next month, uh, which is, uh, which we are very happy that such a, Support is there for this forum and so many people are repeat viewers and so many new viewers are coming out and so on. Uh, we had some interesting lectures in the past. One of our favorites, the, probably the crowd favorite was Arvind Gupta speaking about science through toys. Uh, another very unusual one was uh, a meteorologist, Dr. K. V. Balasubhinyam, who talked about weather and climate in Sangam poetry. We had Dr. Uttarad Rajan talk about Leelavati's daughters, the women scientists of India. We had. Uh, Aparajit Ramnath, a professor at uh, Ahmedabad University, he gave a lecture on the aircraft industry. Mm -hmm. uh, on this particular subject, so we've had lectures on all kinds of topics. Uh, today's lecture, I'll just give you a brief of uh, the topics we've had on astronomy. I, I myself gave a lecture on, this was in Tamil, on the astronomy and mathematics of ancient cultures uh, a few years back. We had a lecture by Akash Narayanan on the story of light. Uh, the history of how light has been understood all the way up to uh, the latest theories, uh, including Maxwell's equation and so on. Uh, we had a very interesting, unusual program uh, where Professor Swaminathan, one of our mentors, uh, taught the students and the teachers of Sevalaya School, um, which is not far from here, uh, Thirunindrabu, actually. Uh, it's a small village called Kaswa, and he, one of our friends, Narayanan, set up a sundial for them. And he taught those teachers how to use the sundial and those teachers in turn taught their students. And we had a program where they you know, explained how they came about this idea, what they did, what they learned, the learning experiences, the teaching experience. Uh, we also run a couple of courses. We've had multiple batches of these courses. One course, of course, is uh, one on Indian astronomy and mathematics, the astronomy of uh, India before the telescope was invented. Uh, this we do both in English and in Tamil. We have done it once in Tamil, a uh, few times in English, both for adults and students, uh, and student school age students. We also have a related mathematics course that Badri occasionally handles. Uh, we have had it separately for uh, linear independent equations called Kutaka. We had one for Bhavana and Chakravala, which are the quadratic independent equations. We will probably have this again in the future. Most recently, we had a lecture titled We Are All Stardust by Deepthi S, uh, an aspiring uh, PhD student. She just, I think, uh, joined the program. She's a postgraduate student from, in physics from Willow Institute of Technology. And uh, uh, she gave a lecture a few months back about We Are All Stardust, which brings us to today's lecture, which is very uh, topical because the James Watt Telescope has been uh, sending some pictures that have captured the imagination of several people. And we are delighted to have uh, Murali Meenakshi Sundaram uh, give us a lecture on the subject. 
Uh, without further ado, I will pass it on to uh, Ramanan to introduce the speaker of the day. Yeah, thanks, Gopu. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so I am I am quite excited about this talk and uh, what led to this. Uh, at a point in human beings' uh, never-ending quest to understand the world, the limitation of the naked eye was felt. This resulted in our first to augment improve the sensorial perceptions and we ended up with telescopes, microscopes and other tools for exploration. And we also understood that each and every tool has its own limitation and that this also curbs what we can know and hence is there is this urge to keep designing better tools and better ways of seeing or perceiving. And one of the ways for seeing for has been placing the tools in the air and sky. For example, Cameras have been around for a long time, but in the last two decades, we have succeeded in miniaturizing the camera and placing it in drones. These are quads, quadcopters, okay? And this gave us a different perception of the world around us. And we have gradually increased the distance from a few meters to thousands of kilometers with corresponding advancement in technology use. Today's topic, JWST, James Webb Space Telescope, is one such attempt to build an eye that orbits Earth at a distance of 1.5 lakh kilometers, okay, 1.5 lakh kilometers, I just want to put that in quote, and it sees the other way. It started with an audacious goal and has also succeeded, and that makes it all the more important to study, to understand, and to even celebrate, okay. Speaking about this topic will be Marli Minakshi Sundaram. Marli has 25 years of experience in consulting in IT industry. For, uh, and he has worked with corporation, governments, institutions on disruptive innovations and emerging technologies. He is a science and astronomy enthusiast and an IIT Madras alumnus belonging to the 1981 batch. He will provide an overview of the web telescope, its engineering. It's, it is a very complex tool, okay? And he will talk about that. What, it, what, are, what, are, what does it mean to uh, talk about Lagrange points? He will also cover that. Uh, basically, the overview, the launch, delays, tracking, how it, uh, how we track that uh, telescope and uh, its success, okay, and the pictures and the impact. So, uh, without much ado, over to you, Marli. Thank you, Ramanan, for the nice introduction. Uh, guys, um, I'm also very excited to talk about the James Webb. Space telescope. Uh, Gopu introduced about the images that it has been sending, and a lot of people are excited about it. I want to take a little bit of time to go back at the origin of you know how they started thinking about it and decided what goes inside that, and then how they launched it into the space, and after that what are the calibration they had to do remotely on that? How did they get the picture? And what are the interpretations? And what is there for all of us? This is not the science and astrophysics alone. There is something for everybody to pick up on that. So I want to pick up on those points as well. And uh, uh, NASA, CSA, and ESA has got multiple programs in for education, formal and informal, in terms of uh, contents that they have. So for aspiring uh, future professional who wants to be in this area, what are the things they will be able to uh, look at? You know, some of those content I'm going to be doing. I got quite a bit of content. Uh, so it's probably a bit ambitious to cover all of that. So. Maybe a little bit of a roller coaster ride for all of you guys. Just stay with me. Um, I'm going to be giving pointers. Most of the people are very aware of how to use the web and uh, what are the links and things like that. So in certain places, I may go a little bit uh, faster. So with this as the introduction, let me uh, go into the topic. So this. Uh, um, this presentation will be available. So Dean's uh, animation is of going through that. Uh, I will leave it to you guys. You can pick up on this uh, a little bit later on. So the focus is more from uh, you know how to think big, execute bigger, and uh, have the vision. You know, so to say, 
in the technology world, they will call it as a moonshot. Here you can probably look at it like a stellar shot, right? So it does as an as an introduction. Let me go in into the presentation. Uh, so I I want to give a you know when I start into that I want to give a introduction on the project management approach for deploying this you know. Uh, starting from launch uh, and as it opens into the sky, it's going to be commissioning the uh, telescope. And as it reaches the point, it's going to be um, uh, setting up all the scientific instruments within that. So, you know, that is the timeline that we have at the top of the screen. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, thank, thanks a lot for, um, the Varahamira Science Forum to um, offer this opportunity. My contact information is given here. I want to like, jump in. When I started this, I wanted to write a poem on that. You know, what would be a better one than to look at the open AI, AI tools technology and modify it a little bit to write a modern poetry on that. So I've used that, I've given the link, give it your uh, try on, uh, exploring the language tools on that. Uh, briefly, this poem written by uh, uh, the AA tool is, the James Webb Telescope with its infrared eyes is orbiting the L2 farther than moon and can see things that we can't even imagine. And it's a modern day equivalent of a poet's pen. And with it, we can explore the universe and more. So a big, a big hand of applause for the uh, open AI tool to write a poem on the JWST. Uh, so there are some additional material I have given at the bottom, uh, but it is to give uh, a, a, a position on where does web stand in terms of the telescope, you know, uh, one on the earth, the radio types, one on the sky, uh, one on the uh, gamma and the x-ray types um, and and web is right there in the uh, near infrared phase and why it is infrared we will cover it in detail uh, more details about all these individual telescopes are given in the appendix for the enthusiast to uh, go about and explore a little bit more so with that as an introduction let's go right in into jwst it's a, uh, you know, uh, what does it have? Let us have uh, a little bit of overview, and when then we'll go into the vision a little bit. It's like a, a very large tennis court kind of a, a shield it has in order to protect it from sun. And we'll cover on why is it had to be protected from uh, um, sun's heat. We will cover it in a bit. Uh, it is an infrared, uh, it has to be at a very cold temperature, and uh, uh, it has a primary compound mirror, 18 of them. You can't have all of them as a single mirror because, you know, it's going to be a very complex one to uh, deploy it in the, um, in the space. So they made it a compound one, and there is secondary mirror. Uh, there are uh, camera instruments at the back, uh, computer at the bottom, and solar cells for driving it uh, um, at the L2, around the L2 uh, point. They call it an L2 orbit. We will cover that also in a while. So um, it's much larger than the uh, earlier predecessor, Hubble mirror. Um, so let's go a little bit deeper and see uh, what it has in the, um, um, from, the, from the real uh, look of it. Um, at the observing side, uh, is, is uh, describing the primary and secondary mirror, and it has the science instrument at the bottom, and the multi-layered sun shield is the one that is protecting it from the uh, sun. We will we'll see about it in a while. On the sun-facing side, uh, you'll see the sheet and the solar power array to uh, gather the solar energy and drive the um, um, drive the telescope as a whole. And then antenna that communicates with the air and steering and control uh, systems are there in that. 
Okay. So let's go into into deep uh, deeper into the JWC. I want to think about uh, to think about few points. You don't have to answer them or find uh, uh, solutions for that. Uh, so we need to think about uh, what does it mean to see things. I don't mean it necessarily in the uh, philosophical sense. I mean it more from the one that we can sense it, right? You know, even though there is there are uh, sound that is coming out, we have managed to look at uh, uh, the collect those information and then construct ultrasound image. And uh, um, and the, and the astronomy and the cosmology has been using it, uh, using the infrared capture as a way to look at pictures and imagine and figure out uh, uh, what is happening in the universe. And uh, uh, and when it comes to infrared, the moment you step into the space, uh, there is extreme low temperature, cryogenic temperatures that we have. Uh, so in that environment, how are you going to uh, collect data data and the uh, sensor information? And, uh, uh, and and what is the use of the uh, space telescope? That itself, uh, one can uh, imagine and uh, collect information about that. There's one other information I wanted to share, and I thought it was pretty um, pretty advanced at even at 1990 they, they had a vision because they thought the outer world space itself is an observable universe uh, and it is the lab itself and you can build tools for that lab to understand the astronomy and cosmology and following that uh, you know the later when they figured out uh, launching Hubble telescope and the JWST uh, they went on to say that it would be better to build telescope in the space itself because they figured out that building it in uh, Earth and launching it and then tracking it is very expensive. If we can figure out approaches and methodologies for building telescopes in the space itself, that will be uh, a larger uh, vision that could advance some of the scientific aspirations that they have. And the new one that's emerging out of this is the um, new technology and the citizen science models um, where, you know, the data, you know, they use different paradigms for that. Some people call it data as an oil um, uh, for the ecosystem and things like that. In this particular context, you can almost see it as a river and you can build civilizations around it to uh, uh, build solutions that will advance our science aspirations or even technology aspirations. One other point to think about is, you know, earlier we had been sending probes to explore and uh, about planets or understanding our solar system and things like that. You know, some of the things like Voyager and Cassini are example. Whereas the space telescope image is, is a little bit more interesting, more uh, uh, more uh, wider vision. The the the, um, the probe is is having a travel kind of an image that are taken, whereas the space telescope images are going to have um, a, a, a deeper understanding about the atmosphere, what are the element it has, and things like that. Uh, one of the far most important and very key element that is coming out of this, uh, uh, the moment we step into space and figured out is uh, the other solar systems that we could identify similar to ours and the exoplanets um, that are explosive in the last uh, you know, 10 or 15 years. And we have more tools and approaches and methodologies of figuring out what are there in the exoplanets from the information that we are collecting. These are some of the things that we need to think about before we launch into the journey or understand uh, the, the, the part of uh, um, the JWST telescope launch, I would say. So this one and the next one, if you will, is a similar one. So with that as a vision, where you know um, uh, it, it has created a, uh, the NASA has created a, 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 a origin subcommittee 
and uh, they wanted to explore uh, steady black holes and supernovae. So they wanted to build a, a, a larger telescope that can observe the universe from outer space. And uh, in the early 90s itself, they started uh, planning for that. At that time, the budget was around uh, $0.5 uh, billion. Uh, the numbers are uh, not necessarily so much about uh, 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 about value itself, but uh, it is about the complexity and the changing nature of uh, goals and vision, and you know uh, the, the type of uh, uh, accountability they are building it around. You know, it's a it's a sense of uh, uh, direction in that is what we are we are trying to cover in this particular aspect. And then in two thousand five, they kind of approached with a replan. Uh, re it went to 5 billion, so 2021 it's 10 billion. Um, roughly 2007 onwards, um, from the thought and vision, it has started, they've started fabrication. And it's like a very complex design. We will go into that in a short while in bits and pieces, not, not the whole thing, because it's a, it's a very, uh, uh, a very large system to even list it out, if you will, right? And it's also, collaborated with a very large organization, 300 plus global organization, 20 uh, years it has taken with 20,000 engineers. Um, some, uh, some information is given. The entire team, they have acknowledged it. Uh, you, can, you can take a look at that. There is an extensive project plan that is uh, uh, given there. And they, they have a deployment explorer. Uh, you'll be able to dynamically see what has happened in the past. You can also see it right now as to where they are. So, you know, um, these, 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 it's a very innovative way in the socializing and proliferating to the entire world as to how their projects are going. And, uh, you know, uh, if somebody wants, um, wants to contribute and uh, give some ideas, they will be able to collaborate with that. At the bottom, I've given some uh, list of uh, uh, companies that have closely uh, worked with them. So, you know, this is how they have started building it. And it's a little bit of glimpse on how um, uh -huh. they have uh, um, finally realized the um, dream project of the JWST telescope. Uh, here, <clears throat> excuse me. A little bit of a comparison between uh, the, the Hubble and the um, JWST and how they got into this larger vision. Uh, you can, you know, the primarily it is capturing um, at the infrared. So Hubble can uh, also capture the visible spectrum, uh, the lower end. Now, uh, you can imagine uh, a mug that you can carry to carry the water and uh, that will be Hubble. And when you look at the web, it will be like a very uh, large packet. You know, we need to collect large amount of uh, infrared signal, um, uh, very, very faint infrared light, you should be able to uh, capture in there. Um, it has over 18 um, um, uh, primary mirror, um, and it needs to be at a very, very uh, low temperature at something like 40 degree Kelvin. And uh, uh, it has to be um, very, very light at low temperature. They've chosen beryllium and uh, uh, added uh, a very thin coat of uh, gold into that. Why did they do it? We'll cover that in a while. Um, you know, so, so, you know, this is the background about, you know, how they end up uh, assuming this geometry, if you will. And, and I know there are a lot of design uh, gone in in terms of how they arrived at uh, uh, this, this large uh, JWST shape, if you will. And uh, following that, you know, if you are going to take pictures in the space, you need to carry all your instrument now itself. So what are the uh, instruments that they are carrying? Um, camera, spectrograph, chronograph, micro shutter array, integral field unit, and the aperture mask are some of the elements that they have carried along. 
and each of the element uh, will have different modes uh, in which they can collect the data and the scientific uh, um, depending on the scientific objectivity that they have they need to arrive at the way they need to collect the information so they have these wild field slitters single object slides slitter multi object mode uh, integral field unit and time series are some of the modes uh, that they actually use to uh, using the instrument to make it happen. So I'm going to go a little bit more into the uh, instrument themselves, you know. So these are um, infrared uh, uh, camera. Uh, one, one of them is a near infrared camera. It was built in uh, 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 Palo Alto, California. It, we are, they are in the near infrared range, five micrometers. And there are about 10 sensor of four megapixel is the one that they will capture. Uh, that is one instrument that is mounted inside the telescope. And the next one is the NIR specs, which is an infrared spectroscope. You know, that is going to um, do the spectrography analysis. And uh, this was uh, done by the ESA. Um, and uh, uh, it, it was uh, uh, made in uh, 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 Netherlands. And uh, uh, it, it was the mechanism uh, and their... Uh, Optical elements were designed, integrated, and tested um, in GM, uh, Carl G. Subtronics. And uh, so this, is a, this is another uh, important camera that is again mounted into the uh, JWST telescope. Uh, the next one is the MIRI, uh, mid infrared instrument. Uh, the mid to long infrared wavelength range, uh, 5 to 27 micrometer. And, uh, you know, um, here, the interesting thing about this is it needs to be at a very cooler temperature. So there is a helium gas mechanical cooler um, uh, sited on the warm side of the environmental shield to provide the necessary cooling for this particular uh, uh, tool. And uh, this is developed in collaboration uh, between NASA and the ESA control. And the last one is the uh, FGS in you know, a fine guidance sensor and the near infrared image the, uh, for the slit spectrograph. This is again uh, developed by CSA. Uh, this is again uh, another important uh, information that is collected and sent over to um, Earth for further analysis on the FGS and uh, NIRISS data, if you will. And when you have all these data, then you need to have uh, computing power communication, electrical propulsion, structural part. So they have something known as the spectrographic bus um, that is developed and that is also uh, mounted into the um, tel telescope, if you will. So these are, these are some of the uh, key element one um, that uh, they are put into the, you know, what goes into the telescope is what we, are, uh, we had seen in a brief point. Now we are coming to the next part, which is you know to appreciate some of the engineering elements that have gone into the JWST. If you will, you know, it's a um, elaborate drawing, um, a side view of the uh, J2 component. If you will, let's go into what are the things that we wanted to um, look at. So the one that's very uh, important and a very nice one um, is. Uh, the uh, the sun shield that they have. Um, second. So I had some notes on that. Just um, so 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 they they, they have uh, this one is made on uh, something known as the cap on E, um, and uh, this was developed by Dupont and uh, um and, and they have on the sun side, when the sunlight is coming into that, you need to be reflecting them. And uh, there is an insulation between multiple layers. So they have from a sun temperature, you know, you're seeing it in the picture of 125 uh, degree temperature. Uh, it's going up to uh, minus 235 degree um, lower temperature you've got to be doing and you have to be protecting the mirror and the instrument on the other side. So, so it, it's a pretty important feat and uh, um, um, the information that I can in this is 
covering about you know um, uh, because we are going very near to the L2, uh, it needs to be protecting the instrument from the sun, and uh, it has the five-layer sun shield. Like I said, you know, it is the Capstone E polymide uh, film that was developed by Dupont, and uh, uh, the the sun shield was uh, hand assembled by this company known as the Mantec. Uh, in, in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, why this is important is, you know, in, sometime in 2018, there was a, a bit of a tear in that. And uh, that has delayed the, the whole project by uh, two years. So, you know, some of the, um, uh, some of the element or some of the single point failures that could potentially happen, we can appreciate it. And, and the larger vision takes that much of, uh, uh, you know, um, readiness to, uh, even if you have a failure, how to pick up and then start uh, working on it again is very important. An interesting thing to note is, you know, one of my classmates, uh, his name is Satyan uh, Anantikrishnan. Uh, he has worked on the shield. He is in uh, Malaysia and, uh, you know, uh, he is very excited. And uh, um, during the launch time, you say, you know, that uh, he was very eagerly waiting for it to go to the L2 point in a, in a, in a, in a very ancient moment, uh, if you will. Okay, so this is about the sun shield, uh, if you will. <clears throat> the next one is, you know, the purpose of uh, the JWST is to look at uh, observing the ancient uh, universe, right? Uh, the, Typically, uh, the idea is the, the, to capture the light uh, that has traveled more than 13 billion years to reach us. Uh, from when, when the universe was only at the 100 billion years old. Um, so we need a telescope that focuses on gathering light that has stretched. So at the time of uh, the origin, it might have been an ultraviolet ray and, uh, you know, uh, the, the light would have been stretched or redshifted over time into infrared light. And that, if we are able to capture, we will be able to carry out our analysis and we will be able to study the distant galaxy. So that is the principle behind it. Again, again from the engineering perspective, I wanted to highlight this point as to you know how and why we are doing that. Then I want to go into some of the complexity itself, you know. Uh, so I given, you know, the world largest diesel engine or the jet engine. If you compare these two, uh, the complexity will be of one order, something like 10 times one would say. Uh, but if you take it to something like uh, JWST, uh, this will be, I would say, at least uh, uh, six or seven orders, you know. The complexity of the uh, the mirror, uh, the instruments that we have, the computation that we have, and the shield that we talked about, all of them cannot go as a straight uh, uh, um, uh, geometric structure. It needs to be folded like an origami, and then it needs to be put into the um, the the uh, the aerial five shape, and it has to be launched. So so the you know, if, if somebody can imagine the complexity, then, you know, that is another point to appreciate what is going on into the launch itself, you know, so it, uh, so, so looking at it is, a, is a, thinking about it is a very tremendous uh, uh, way to appreciate um, the complex uh, way in which we can structure it, build it, launch it, and uh, control it remotely from the space. Uh, I've given few animation that you may be able to carry on uh, later on. I, I thought I'll show one of them, one or two of them that is primarily uh, showing the animation with respect to um, the, uh, the, the uh, MIDI spectroscopy. It gives a appreciation for how light, light is captured and uh, how it is uh, uh, split into various aspects. How the spectrography is analyzed is uh, given in this. This particular animation video is developed by ESA or the European Space uh, Association. 
Similarly, in the next one, we will look at the um, uh, mirror alignment and why it is very uh, critical for us to uh, capture that uh, mirror alignment uh, in, 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 for, for our actual data analysis, if you go. This is given a fantastic animation with respect to how the mirror spectroscopy animation work and what are the various components and things like that. Let's go over to the next part, which is the mirror alignment. When it reaches the LCD, what really happens? So the nanometer level control uh, you'll be doing at the mirror, which we'll cover in a short while. <clears throat> Many of the videos are there. Uh, you may be able to uh, uh, look at them at your leisure. Uh, the idea is not to show all the video or the links, uh, but uh, to show you the pointers and and you know at, at leisure you will be able to appreciate the various activities that will be seen. Here, what it is doing is uh, 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 getting those images and aligning it, focusing it, calibrating it. Now, these are some of the critical things uh, that they are doing in this. So these are the various aspects. You know, you are you are, you are collecting images. You'll be able to uh, stack it. You'll be able to course phase it, and then finally uh, do a final uh, finishing on that. Okay, let's go back, guys. So here is where we are. Let's go back. So a uh, few of the very interesting, as as you know, I'm I, I'm a metallurgist, uh, and then like uh, all engineers, I come to IT industry. But I've always uh, appreciated uh, anything that's to do with uh, uh, a deeper analysis of metal. So the mirror has to be in beryllium. Why beryllium? Uh, you know, you could do lithium, which is a very light material. But uh, uh, there are three aspects that the NASA professionals are saying, you know, it's very good at beryllium. Is the metal, uh, it's very strong. It's about six times uh, stiffer than steel. It's very light uh, compared to, uh, you know, the only thing that's lighter than this is lithium, right? And uh, at a very low temperature, which is very, very uh, important, at cryogenic temperature, um, it doesn't change its shapes. It, you know, that is very critical for the stability of the telescope itself. Right? And then it's very expensive. Uh, and it's also very hard to machine. So these are some of the engineering challenges that they had in terms of uh, um, doing that. Right. And then over on top of it, they are having uh, a, a thousand atom. This is the one I saw, I think. Uh, gold quotation, gold quote on that. Why Why gold? Because, you know, you need to capture the infrared. Uh, there are many uh, material that are available, you know, that's given at the middle, uh, if you will, right? So among that, they figured out that uh, gold reflects a maximum of 99% of the infrared. So, so uh, it is having a very thin coat of uh, gold on top of it. Okay. Now the mirror itself needs to be aligned in different ways. You know how do they do it? They have actuators, uh, something like one thirty-two of them. You can see it at the right bottom of that, right? And uh, eighteen uh, mirror segments will be used to change the curvature of the uh, mirror itself. You've seen the hexagonal one, right? So. They shaped it like hexagonal to be uh, able to uh, control it very effectively. And we could do an X, Y, and the Z um, curve we'll be able to do. And at a nano scale level, you know, uh, something like at 10 nanometers, you will be able to control it. You know, imagine this, uh, something like a 1.5 million uh, kilometers away. Remotely, you are able to control and accurately change the curvature of that in order to get that. So this kind of angle is very important because in astronomical uh, uh, terms, it could mean uh, calibrating it, capturing the picture correctly, or you could be losing a particular object very easily. So these are very uh, important one, very high precision engineering activity that needs to be done on this. 
So let's spend a little bit of time on the L2. So L2 is the point <clears throat> where, you know, um, the, the, when you have multiple planets, you know, uh, these were probably at the time of telescope times, you know, where they kind of figured out as to what are the places where the, ob the, the a, an object could be uh, at a minimum gravitational influence between two planets, if you will, right? So between Sun, Sun, and uh, Earth, what are the L2 points? They have, you have like uh, uh, five points in which the gravitational uh, field will be uh, minimal. Now, when you have this JWST, you don't want the JWST to be, to be in the gravitational point itself. You want to be able to uh, orbit around it so that, you know, when, when the Earth finishes one cycle, you will be able to uh, do a similar thing as well. Why, do they, why don't we want it at L2? Because, you know, if you are in L2, uh, the, the telescope could, itself could be... Uh, uh, could have that eclipse effect on the on the telescope itself, so you won't be able to uh, capture or observe things that you want to do. So you want to be able to be away at the same time, figure out a mechanism in which you want to travel along with the Earth and capture as much information as possible. So, so you know that that is a tricky point. Uh, 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 calculations and activities that you need to manage, plan in this uh, L2 orbit nav navigation, if you will. So I have two animations that, that will probably help you to understand a little bit more. If you want to have a follow-up session and want to do more, we, we, can, we can follow it up with that as well. So, you know, in picture really, it gives you a, a thing, right? You know, so you have the sun, you have the earth, and you have the L2 point you can see, and you have the web's orbit uh, that is going around that. Right, so, so uh, and then the whole thing is coming around the sun. So you will be able to observe it, and you can do it for next, uh, effectively next 20 years. Uh, the James Webb Telescope will be able to um, send, send us the uh, information, if you will. So I want to uh, spend a little bit time on this because you know there there are a lot of. Uh, uh, thinking going around that even from the future perspective. So uh, L2, you have the sun shine and the, the, the shield is protect, protecting the instrument from the sun and it's very good for observing the other side of the web, you know. So in, interestingly, what the web uh, JWST cannot observe is the uh, inner side of the uh, uh, web telescope, right? You know, Earth or Mercury or Sun, uh, those are some five objects in, in astronomy you won't, you won't be able to uh, capture through the JWST, right? And what they are saying is if you really want to study something and have a telescope or an instrument, L1 is a better point for studying the sun. L3 is far away, it is more like a stealth mode. If you want to run some defense operation or secretive operation, you may be able to do it in L3. And they're saying L4 and L5 is very ideal for building your space station. Remember, we talked about uh, you know, uh, NASA's vision to develop a telescope in the space itself. Yeah. If you typically want to do... No, is there a disruption? No, you can continue. No disruption. Everything is fine. Okay. All right. So L4 and L5 are uh, typical points for... Uh, um, building your space station and then uh, building your telescopes of the future, if you will. So, so they, are, they are very effective, if you will, right? So there are some notes I've kept uh, uh, in here on the L2 itself. Uh, so, uh, so there was a question about, you know, is there any other uh, spacecraft that is orbiting L2? Answer is yes. Uh, you know, they have this uh, Herschel Space Observatory. Um, and then they have Planck Space Observatory that are already orbiting the uh, L L2 point, right? Um, right. Um, the, the que other question that they have is uh, typically, uh, can we service the web, right? No. So web, web telescope is far away, right? Uh, 
So the answer to that is we won't be able to service web, you know, hub we will be able to fix because it's very near to the earth. So they've designed several, uh, uh, what, what is called uh, 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 failure function spot. They have two cameras for everything. Uh, uh, so, uh, so even if something were to fail, uh, what are the business continuity or the operational continuity you need to have they thought about it and build everything uh, into that. So, so, so I mean, it's it's, uh, it's quite a bit of uh, uh, thinking and operations that has gone into the uh, the the JWST design, if you will. Right? Um, how do they talk to that? You know, they they have a lab in uh, California, um, and uh, you know, it's called. Uh, the Space Telescope Science Institute. See, I put it in the printout because all of the terms I'm not able to uh, uh, remember very well. So that is the central one, which is collecting all the data from the James uh, Webb Telescope. And then uh, it will be able to uh, send it to their deep space network. And then uh, uh, which transmits back to the uh, a web, if you will. So web data are returned to deep space network uh, to STCL, where they are processed, distributed to the scientific community, and added to STCL's public accessible archive. You know, this I'm going to cover a little bit later, where they have quite an aspiration for developing citizen data, uh, if you will. So obviously, you know, there will be some interesting question about how much data is their WSPs. Spending per day, it's spending about it is sending about 57.2 gigabytes of data, and uh, within a second, it could potentially send 28 megabits per second. And uh, uh, you know, a trivial question is how long does it take for the data to come to air? It takes about five seconds. You now, obviously, 1.5 million is around one one million mile. It takes about five five seconds to come for the uh, information to go or come back to that. And what is the frequency in which it is uh, getting transmitted? They are calling it the S-band frequency, uh, is used for uplink, low rate elementary downlink, and uh, ranging. So KA band frequency are used for high rate downlink of science data and telemetry. So these are band that will be uh, uh, useful for us to cover on that. So let's go into the data. I hope I have time. Uh, so the, the launch. So launch is very, uh, before launch, I wanted to talk about few pickups. Any project will have uh, hiccups, right? So uh, I, like I said earlier, uh, in 2018, the film uh, got a little bit of tad during the deployment testing, and uh, that added to further delays in the uh, telescope. It went through a very cigarette, uh, very rigorous uh, project management, and uh, they figured out 344 single point failures. Typically, single point failures are when you have a failure, you won't be able to proceed further to that in that uh, spot. So that is too many of them for to have a risk. So they have to go back to uh, the drawing board to fix some of them and come come back to that. So I, I want to appreciate some of the dimensions that you have. Uh, uh, you know, to to have a vision for the project, build it at the time of launching potential problems that you have, and then uh, see see the light at the end of the day is, is, a, is, is, a, is a is a is a quite a bit of a daunting task, I would say. The political aspect of it is even more interesting. You know, obviously, when the government changes, they see that you know spending on certain uh, type of programs is too expensive are not worth it, so they cut it, and then that introduced certain delays into the project, right? You know, this one traces what happened in 2011, 2012, it came back, and uh, and and in November 2011, uh, they were able to get back into the tax to to go ahead with already existing plan. And recently, after deployment, there was a small meteorite, micro meteorite, they call it. And you know that again has uh, damaged our uh, seal, if you will, right? And uh, um, so C3 mirror segment has suffered a little bit, but the NASA engineers are saying 
they have remotely compensated for. So it gives us a sense of complex operations that we already have. Right? So uh, finally, on December the 25th, 2021, uh, the world was seeing it, watching it. They had given several uh, channel that was continuously monitoring it. I was watching it uh, for the entire thirty days. It was much more interesting than any of the any of the serial that we typically see uh, either in Netflix or Prime. I would say so. I I loved it. I loved it, and uh, so the, the journey uh, the, the journey started. Uh, and you know it was in the uh, alien uh, five rocket that carried the web um, so separating from the observatory uh, in 27 minutes into the flight at this point engineers web mission operation center at the telescope um, then they took the control uh, so you know so the, the, that we are going to see it in your mind engineers uh, in web mission control uh, center initiated and uh, oversaw each of the step you no know? uh, so each of the step will mean that you know deploying it tensioning it separating the web sun shield uh, a five layer diamond shaped structure which is the size of the tennis court uh, extending the secondary mirror support structure unfolding the primary mirror which has an honeycomb like pattern 18 hexagonal gold plated mirror segment all of them, as it opened, we were able to see, you know, because they made it open and public, we were able to see it happening. So, so th those are some of the uh, exciting things, you know, uh, 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 that that we were seeing, right? And uh, obviously, uh, as soon as you de deploy the telescope, people will say, why are we not seeing the image? Why does it take so much time for you to get the image, you know, in each of that, uh, you have deployments, you have telescope mirror alignment, and then you, all the cameras that we remember we saw, it needs to be calibrated and, uh, uh, and, and you know, uh, and all of this will take uh, uh, about, uh, would, would take about two months and, and uh, we were able to see it happening and what is happening was uh, open to uh, public as well, right, you know, is, is what we saw. And uh, you know, so just to give an impression of what happens from the earth all the way up to the fully unfolded is uh, uh, is, is shown in this particular uh, screen and initial sunshield deployment, full secondary deployment, and the fully unfolded is what we see. And then another one I given in terms of you know what happened in each of the operations. Uh, launch plus 15 day at the 15th day it was fully deployed it is uh, um, uh, saturday 1822 um, and then the individual mirror alignment in the in the alignment what is there what are the things that we need to do from segment identification alignment image stacking force phasing all the things you remember we saw it in the video all of them need to be managed effectively so these are the operations that one needs to be uh, aware of. And the individual instrument mode checkout uh, will have to be done as well. Right? And finally, we come to the uh, commanding web uh, from the Baltimore. Uh, um, and uh, STCL engineers sit at the controls. They send command to the web, uh, which the telescope executes. They are supported by scientists and team members from the mission partners. The team also continuously monitors the health of the telescope. Right, so, so you know that 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 is the kind of uh, operation. These are the people at some level logically were immediately next to the James Webb telescope. If you will. So uh, before we go to the next section of the first few images, uh, I just want to quickly run about why it is the infrared. So the infrared is is able to look into the dark a little bit more. Right, and uh, uh, you know, so the, you can see in this picture the meerkats, the fur is even more brighter, and uh, you can see and gather information and gather intelligence from the infrared. So, so you know, uh, that's the one uh, that they typically highlight why infrared is becoming such an important one for us to capture and uh, look at it as well, right? So. 
here one one thing that they uh, try to caution us for accuracy is typically people will uh, interpret infrared for uh, heat so uh, infrared light and heat is associated but infrared does not mean it is heat so that's the one that we need to remember because you know what what we are capturing is is at a very very cold temperature and a very very feeble signal uh, signals and we are trying to process and analyze uh, through that this again is to understand the engineering aspect of uh, uh, it from the uh, from i would say thought perspective or intellectual uh, approach perspective right so you can see the visible spectrum at the middle and the infrared is the one that is 600 to 28800 nanometers is the one that is surprising the spitzer telescope is at even at the uh, deep deep infrared uh, is the one that they are carrying on that so this this will help us in terms of uh, understanding where we are operating why it is becoming such an important one for us right uh, so from the telescope perspective uh, uh, you know what we see in the visible light near infrared and uh, mid uh, infrared light spitzer images are the one that we are seeing, looking at it now so we saw the uh, we saw the uh, thought level we saw the vision we saw the instrument folded together we saw the launch and then after launch we saw this wonderful five pictures that are there this the picture as it is is uh, uh, looks very not, uh, very different right and then we have this uh, uh, deep field uh, smac picture and what is interesting is you know this is supposed to be at the grain of uh, the sky is what it is saying here and you see this uh, uh, at the middle there is a circular thing going out so right so we have to remember this now you know that the, the concept of gravitational lens has been only concept for us but you know here is the maybes that we are saying of, of course we need to do further analysis to validate and do it. you know this is a bad you know the vision of uh, uh, the uh, nasa you know, remember we talked about 19 uh, back in 1990s they are using the space as the lab and you know what we observed we are able to validate it so it becomes really a lab in which we can conduct experiment we can look at it and we can bring in the sense of uh, uh um uh, you know uh, the, the the scientific thinking in our way of life if you will you know those those are opportunities for us and then if, if you go into that we, we may revisit it once again you know that uh, the spectrography it's able to specific typically identify there's one other video which actually explains as to how uh, when the light comes through this uh, uh, this atmosphere or these galaxies Uh, how it's able to uh, go through this element we are able to pick up the atmospheric composition we are able to see the uh, uh, lines that are belonging to that this is the nirss uh, composition that we are seeing so these are these are these are the one that are uh, after the analysis uh, the entire scientific community is uh, very excited about it and it Now we were only looking at only uh, ga galaxies and gases that are there, and in this picture, if you look at uh, the top line, you have 13.1 billion years ago, and then you're seeing the NIR cam imaging, and the spectrography is able to identify oxygen, hydrogen, neon. You know, uh, you know, suddenly you know, you're able to you're you're you feel like Sherlock Holmes. You know, you're able to uh, logically derive and detect what is going on uh, in that. so this is uh, the some planetary uh, some uh, star is dying there is a black hole it's about to come in there so the planetary nebula the ngc picture we able to go deeper and analyze that and this they call it a stefan's quintet and there is a, a one of them is supposed to be a little bit far away it four of them are together at the front and there is a, a, a a uh, black hole that is very close to that and that's where you are able to see the shift in light and things like that so th these are these five pictures uh, has excited the entire world in a, a very big way and there is also a, a, a indian stalwart uh, prajwal uh, sastri she has given a very detailed nice explanation on that 
in terms of you know why everybody is uh, excited on that this is again another terrain nebulas and this is going into the detail as to how this mirkan imaging is processing uh, the individual uh, image you are able to cut it out and you are able to get depending on the brightness you are able to identify specific uh, things that are uh, there in the galaxy or in the cloud and we'll go into the uh, exoplanet in a short while right so so the composition of gas around the black hole you are able to figure out you know is it atomic hydrogen ion ions atomic hydrogen molecular hydrogen you are able to figure out depending on the wavelength you are able to isolate it and you are able to have a deeper study on the galaxy once again you know it's good back to the vision of the nasa where the lab is out there for us in the space so we need to get there and work in the lab is a is one that's very uh, important in that and uh, <clears throat> so the exoplanets and the elements over you know so the distant planets are there there is a star like a sun like star planets going around there these are all theories before now when the light of the uh, star or the sun like star is dipping a little bit they were able to figure out uh, uh, a planet going across and they were able to even figure out what are the elements that are there uh, within the planet and these are very interesting you know so only because of our ability to go out there in space and have an extensive study like this we were able to do this i would say right so this is the um, interesting point in that and uh, to to kind of you know summarize most of the points uh, web is uh, uh, giving us the exciting discovery is able to give us Uh, deep insight into the early universe galaxies over time star life cycle and an insight into the other worlds these are the great things and then finally even within our inner planets uh, it's able to give us some insight into that right you know jupiter they are able to you know the, this is a new picture that they got from that it's able to gather data on the mars jupiter which is shown uh, in the infrared right saturn uranus neptune and uh, even the cupier belt object help us to build a broader picture of the object in our solar system you know so the infrared is able to you know like like we said earlier in like in the meerkat you are able to see the perth you are able to see the inside content of each of these planets or uh, asteroid or whatever we are think about thinking about it so even from the inner solar system from the outer uh, galaxies it's doing a tremendous job for us and uh, it's a recent picture from the messier right and the next uh, few slides are uh, more of uh, links provided by nasa uh, everybody feels to contribute everybody can contribute into that so uh, citizen of data science is having web tracker and uh, uh, jwc tracking the universe and you know some of the data that they talked about is fed back into the common one from the scs scl is all out there and it's up to us to look at the data and uh, figure out whatever we want to contribute in and nasa has a lot of contents you know this is something it may help some of the uh, uh, institution that are logged in into the web um, so they have a lot of formal education content if you want to run space program space related activity building space station fuels lot of things are happening in there so lesson plan activity for formal education is out there from nasa from their partner institution is all uh, there and you can design your structure on that from the informal part in terms of activity building sample telescope building a game programming trying to figure out about how to uh, uh, interpret the picture various kinds of information are available in the uh, uh, nasa field and uh, both their partner and individual activities are given in the uh, uh, lecture if you will and if, as a scientist as a enthusiast as somebody who wants to give lecture there are plenty of material available in the, in the jwsp uh, uh, area etc right so all of them can be 
uh, effectively used. So those are the information that uh, you'll be able to use. Um, so, so, I mean, uh, make use of all of them and get benefit out of that. Right? And finally, for the few trivia is, um, I put a, a, I can't resist uh, uh, looking at a Dilbert comment. So that is out there for you to have a little laugh. Uh, so are there Indians in the JWST? Absolutely. So and I told you about my uh, classmate who has worked on the Shield. Uh, there are three Indians worked on the JWST team. Hashima was working on the public outreach, and uh, Dr. Kartik Shet is on the astrophysics part, and uh, uh, Kalyani Sukhatame is a MIRI project. You remember the MIRI instrument that we talked about? She is the one managing that. And of course, in, in the JWST, is Indian collaborating? Yes, uh, from TIFR, Manoj Pravantana is collaborating. He's supposed to be an expert in the exoplanet, so you know he's working at all the data that is out there and he's working on that. And Jesse Jose, as of today, morning she gave a lecture and uh, she's more on the uh, gravitational lens expert. So she's looking at all the uh, data uh, related to that. <clears throat> and finally, in, in India as well, um, not that I uh, know about everything, I covered everybody. I might have missed out accidentally few people. And here are the information I collected about uh, some of the stalwart in astrophysics. Ajit Kambavi has worked on collecting data. He's built uh, machine learning algorithms and AI algorithms for astronomical data. So he's given a good lecture on that. I've given a link. And Prajwal Sastri is, a, 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 is, a, is really a very uh, impressive professional. And uh, she's given a very understanding, uh, very understandable Layman, uh, we will be able to get it. You know that kind of a lecture is given on JWST images. Uh, I've provided the link, and she has also given a very useful material on if you want to become an astrophysicist. Uh, very inspiring lecture. Uh, it's also talked about our educational system and what could be done on that, and what are the materials we could potentially be using in the uh, JWST images and things like that. Right, so, so those are some of the things. And then finally, uh, very wonderful JWST videos are out there. Uh, expert speeches there, video postcards are there. Some of these things are very interesting. So with that, uh, I come to the uh, end of the session. Thanks for the NASA, ESA, CSA, YouTube, OpenUI for providing me the uh, poem, Varaha Mira Science Foundation, Raman and Jagannathan, you know, you being uh, sharing the enthusiasm with me, Madhu, my friend, my niece, Harini, to review some of the things and figure out, you know, is, is everything going over the head or she's able to understand it? And all the participants and enthusiasts, a big thank you. And I finally want to, uh, I have this, my information on that. I want to finally end up with, you know, apart from the telescope information I have given, uh, I want to give an idea, you know, all the technology that they are using, it's not just for space alone. They've turned it inside and they've used something known as a spin-off. Every year they have a, a thing called a spin-off uh, magazine and they use it for, you know, if something can be used uh, for the local people or uh, humanities use. Um, there is a website for that and there is a, an archive for every year. What are they doing? Information is there. And then an example of, you know, the space bank is used for uh, a very nice one for protecting from temperature and rain is being used, and that's a good example. And again, uh, a, a pure water anywhere. Uh, again, uh, you know, it's an element uh, uh, that has been used in space uh, that has found a use here. So that is again, you know, uh, is another thing to uh, think about in the JWST, uh, uh, not necessarily JWST. In the space program. So with that, uh, I wrap up. I might have overshot the time. My apologies for that. But I was very excited and I really thank uh, the forum for giving me the opportunity. Let me stop here. And if any questions or comments are there, I'll be more than happy to take them. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Murali. Uh, so uh, I want to convert this session into a series of Q&As which I hope will make a uh, few things clearer. Um, 
there are uh, there are lots of um, questions that i am anticipating many people will have so let me start with uh, uh, you know well before uh, james webb uh, telescope right the typical uh, early telescope i'm talking about right from the galileo's time to newton and everybody else who started building telescopes they were made of glass right initial ones either they were using lens or they were using mirror right and they built uh, uh, magnification so they could see something which is far away which uh, otherwise look very tiny or uh, not at all to our human eyes so we used the uh, uh, this device that we call a telescope to make it large enough for us to see and observe right that's how we were able to see uh, jupiter's moons or even uh, planets such as uranus and neptune which we were not uh, uh, you know things that we could not see with our naked eyes right up to saturn we can see the dot uh, without uh, the need for a telescope and after the eye if you need anything uh, more uh, you need at this telescope right now before this infrared telescope i am aware of a whole bunch of radio telescopes that were deployed can you say a little bit about it as in what are these uh, you know because i have seen these huge uh, dish antenna type of things what were they observing if if i can't observe a visible light so there are uh, you know uh, lenses and mirrors you are not going to deploy lenses and mirrors what can you get and what can you pictureize with that first then we'll go to infrared sure um that's very uh, fine question so i uh, write about uh, the visible spec you know the earlier part we were only addressing the visible part of it right correct correct next to visibility is uh, the more exposure of the visible light itself right you know you would have okay. seen geostationary uh, satellite you know if you are looking at a jupiter you take a uh-huh. usual picture then okay. you would only get certain information about that but if you are able... you're talking about you know the uh, let's say you know i have a camera and there is only a certain exposure time correct. you're talking about a long exposure correct uh, shot if at all uh, we can bring it close correct. to a camera analogy correct that is the next level uh, but okay right so the, okay. they were able to, were able to do wonders on that you know we were able to uh, observe galaxies our milky way was looking much better those were okay. uh, very nice thing right okay. so again uh, so again you know to go back i'll, I'll have to probably uh, share my uh, screen if it's okay yeah yeah please go ahead please go ahead um that is the i'm I may have to go back all the way. Um, uh, either that, or you just uh, escape from the presentation mode. Okay. Go to the uh, screen you okay. want, and then Thank uh, you. you can go. Right. Thank you. Thank you. It's a good one. Oh, I'm still there. <laughs> Hold on one second, guys. Sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. Right. You were able to see this, right? So yeah. Um, so so some of the uh, ground one that you are saying, Ruby, or the ELT, uh, they they were on the visible spectrum, probably infrared a little bit on that, right? Mm-hmm. Now, if you look at the entire spectrum. you are having from gamma ray all the way up to radio waves right and each right. of them uh they, it is out there the space is filled with that actually you know you can almost think it like a you know different categories of c if you will perfect 
right? So the C are separated by their wavelength and we are able to uh, isolate them. Then you get information about them. Right? Bro, just give me one example. Again, you know, here I am presenting myself as a very lay user. Okay. Uh, tell me some, some object out, out there which I wouldn't have been able to see using the visible uh, lens mirror glass uh, telescope. Definitely. But something that the gamma ray telescope will show me. What would be that? Uh, so, uh, I would put it this way. You know, some, uh, let's go to the radio wave that you will be able to understand. Okay. Pulsar are okay. a good example. Pulsar are a good example. You wouldn't Pulsars. Be able, uh, okay. So, Pulsar is a... Uh, is, is a, um, uh, in, the, in the life cycle of a star, uh, it is one of the stage in which before it's going to a black hole or supernova, it becomes a pulsar. It can remit okay. uh, radio waves for you. Right? Okay. So if it, it. if it is emitting radio waves, then uh, you won't be able to see it in uh, gamma, uh, in the visible spectrum at all, or the infrared okay. activity. Okay. Okay. So, so it may look like an empty space for you, but there are radio waves that are there that is giving us some information. So normally, okay, in the, in the earth, a radio wave means somebody is sending you some signal. So there is a transmitter, there is a receiver, right? Okay. But whereas okay. in the astronomy parlance, uh, you know, you don't have a intelligence at the other end. So there is an object that's emitting radio waves. Let's figure out what is that and what does it look like, right? So that needs okay. to be captured. And uh, for collecting radio waves, there are a lot of uh, uh, ways. You know? So let me go back to that SQA or the square kilometer array uh, radio wave. So, so this is the one that is in, the, uh, I have to show you something in Atacama. Mm. Uh, this is in South Africa, I think. Right. So what they do is, you know, you need a, uh, either you can put it as a large one antenna, in which case uh -huh. it becomes different, difficult for you to manage everything. Right. You know, okay. even uh, uh, it does, it's not able to service you uh, effectively. But if you're able to build a network of them, just like the way we looked at the, um, looked at the uh, multiple mirror in uh, uh, James Webb telescope, you know, so if you are yeah. able to break down into smaller, you can even think it as one of the earlier Descartes recommendations. If you want to solve the problem, break it into small pieces that you can manage, then you will be able to do it, you know, something like that. So, so this radio telescope is able to capture all the radio waves and then do the analysis and process and get you the radio images for the sources for you. That is one example. So when, uh, you know, just, just uh, you know, indulge me a little bit more. So mm -hmm. when I get these radio waves, I can I can understand. Can I can I sort of recreate a picture? See, in a visual uh, telescope, gives me roughly the dimension and various other things. But if I get a pointed radio waves coming from a particular place, what can I you know? Can I understand its size, shape, characteristic? What all can I actually get from that? Mm. So it, it varies with the spectrum. I think you need to go okay. to spectrum one, actually. For example, remember I told you about infrared. Yeah. Infrared can give you information about uh, um, its shape, where it is coming from. If you do the spectrographic analysis, you may be able to do more. So you may have to okay. build a specific spectrographic analysis for each of the wave spectrum, if you will. You need to be able to filter it well while it travels through the medium. The space is a very, uh, I would say, uh, harsh medium, right? So it goes through certain medium for you. So when it okay. passes through a medium, it, it changes its behavior. So if you're able to theorize that and figure out where it is coming out, so it's going to, uh, it'll allow you to uh, capture certain information about it. For example, in infrared, uh, I hope you're seeing that, right? In, in infrared, yeah, yeah. because of the four mirrors that we saw, we are able to go into the uh, in, in mirror, in near, near infrared spectrum 
near infrared spectrum, deep infrared spectrum, you are able to build patterns and you are able to say, I think through this particular uh, cloud, galaxy cloud, when it is coming, I am able to see sulfur, oxygen, and water. That you are able to see that. Now, if you want to build a radio telescope, you got to go there. For example, I'll tell you a project that the radio telescope were doing. They built something mm -hmm. called Event Horizon Telescope. You might have heard about it. You might have heard that they, uh, they build the visualization for black holes sometime back, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in, the, in that, they turned the entire Earth into a telescope. So they placed six uh, different telescopes at various places. Atacama was one, uh, Jap uh, Tokyo was another one. And then they had one in South Africa. They had one in Canada. So six places, Antarctica, they had one, I think. So mm -hmm. if you, you, you imagine that you get a glass piece, you know, you got to imagine like that from one place. And then you got to, you got six different glass pieces from various part of the earth. This is inside for it. And then we have mm -hmm. to put it all together and figure out in this space, what could potentially be the uh, image of the black hole. And there were several analyses in which they were to, the, the professional were to work for three or four um, images and finally they converged into one. So those kind of uh, spectrum analysis and characteristics will have to be figured out for each of the uh, so, so if I may, if I, yeah. uh -huh. and then you got to figure out what can be uh, gotten from that. So, if if I may say this, if if I want to understand one specific point in space, let's just just say for uh, argument's sake, then I can get a far better picture by putting together multiple telescopes to view that. You know, the visible range there. The infrared range there, the gamma ray range <laughs> there, the uh, X-ray range, the microwave range. So I just look at a narrow space, hit all kinds of uh, telescopes in that particular region, get all the data, and I can then piece them together to create a much better picture of, when I say I'm using a word picture here, very uh, loosely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A picture of what I can see there or what I can uh, estimate to be there than just a visual spectrum. Can I say that? Uh, so, a okay. little bit of qualification you may have to put in there, by the way. I think okay. you know, there, uh, because there are, uh, in order for you to look at a specific category or the spectrum of uh, electromagnetic spectrum, if you will, right? Okay. Uh, you need to figure out where the abundance is. That is where you will be able to see, actually, right? For example, okay. uh, let's put it, let's flip it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Where can you get the best visible spectrum? Mm -hmm. You can do mm -hmm. it in the earth itself. It's a low cost for it, okay. right? Okay. Uh, you don't have to if you go to uh, space, you can get more. Definitely you can get more. But we are not focusing on visible spectrum in space. Do you understand where I am going with now? Mm -hmm. Now, radio, you can get it on the Earth itself, actually. You don't have to go there, right? Okay. But, but if you look at Fermi or Gamma or X-ray, it doesn't come this far. You may have to go to the atmospheric layer to figure out where the abundance where is. Where to? Okay. Does okay. it make sense now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if you do the analysis right. on that, you can figure out, you know, what is the best space I can do. Space is very good for infrared and the deep infrared. Okay. Okay. Got it. I understand now. So there's a question from uh, Ramaswamy. He says, uh, uh, I will, you know, it's in three, four parts. Uh, in the 42nd slide, going off tangent, considering the fact that JWST is some one and a half million kilometers away. Is there a longitudinal time-wise image set of the same area over a period of some time? So that image taken of the same area from the surface of the earth and then by JWST can be compared for getting a handle on the SNR reduction and what order of magnitude better resolution is possible via JWST, etc. 
can you share your pointers and ideas is some back calculation possible for earth based images to have possible approximate resolution of jwst yeah i think it's a, it's a, it's a good uh, future project i think certainly definitely uh, to think about you know so interestingly what we have now is we have all the analysis tools for us and uh, we will be able to effectively uh, use that uh so okay. so let's say that, that you want to uh let's say use your computational uh, architectural tool to figure out what could be potential image at that spot uh probably in 4 or 5 years time you may be able to get there i think i hope i answered the question uh do you want to show uh, any presentation or do you want to then otherwise you can stop sharing your screen yeah, yeah. okay mm -hmm. so uh, so i i understand that you know you uh, you have a range of spectrum and therefore you will have to create different types of telescopes uh, beyond the lens and mirror driven optical telescopes there were these radio telescopes gamma ray etc and as part of that now you have this infrared uh, you know infrared uh, telescope and it requires somewhere up there uh, rather than here uh, which is what the james webb telescope has done now let me ask you this different question uh, in terms of size right end of the day you know i'm i'm just guessing right uh, in the optical uh, telescope as well as in the radio telescope we are trying to make larger and larger telescopes or as you uh, showed in the radio telescope uh, hundreds of them strewn around so that you can capture uh, you know a reasonable amount of data about a particular point right in the if i if i go back to the optical telescope if my if i have a very large uh, curvature lens or a mirror my ability to see far or capture a faint star would be better at the exposure and so on and so forth now is there again you know you showed the size of james webb telescope uh so is it possible to envisage something which is uh, twice as large four times as large 10 times as large tomorrow in the uh, infrared telescope uh, uh, you know category uh Uh, from the possibility side yes but let's take a moment and think about it for a while but while while you are given a, a physical lens characteristic as a base for developing these tools right mm -hmm. uh, uh, the one that fascinated while preparing for this uh, uh, lecture is uh, the expert has a view of a bucket are different uh, 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 different volumes of uh, 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 liquid that you can collect over a period of time they they are having okay. this this particular concept actually right okay so at some level it doesn't really does it really matter we need to think about this aspect i think you know uh, mm -hmm. does it really matter i need to build a big one or is it okay if i send a small one and collect the information and build a big one it is the reverse see if you look at the est or the event horizon telescope they didn't build a, a big telescope like the size of the earth but they yeah. kind of uh, did six of them and they were able to reconstruct a larger uh, uh, radio telescopic image looking from the earth you know that they were able to do so these are the dichotomy i think you know these are two things what is useful for you in terms of the goal that you are trying to achieve you may have to construct a specific type of uh, lens i think badri does it make sense okay so so uh, i don't know i mean my whole point was to sort of trigger questions mm -hmm. where uh, uh, you know where we have whether we have uh, you know what next so uh, earlier we were talking about bigger and bigger and bigger telescopes right so is it something similar in the uh infrared telescope as you know the next one will be uh double the size the next one will be four times the size is it how it is going to be i'm just asking 
or it will have to be a different strategy right mm-hmm. now i think there is there is a reason why yeah, right, yeah. I, I, okay you go ahead and then i'll tell you why i am even coming to this okay i think in the stepwise innovation side there may be next generation targeting uh, uh-huh. larger telescope but there will okay. be a disruptive innovation that breaks this rule and say you know what i don't want to take this approach i want to take uh-huh. a different approach to make it happen that can also happen right so the, the reason why i'm even asking is that these are expensive undertakings right to envisage something like this build it you no know, plan build launch assemble correct you no know, control from here assemble collect data process data and then come and tell us hey this is what we have understood right so you already have a hypothesis you have we have we have historically right from the earliest telescope from the 17th century onwards we have been collecting massive quantities of data which has extended the uh, our understanding of universe right what we thought was just a planetary system and there is only one sun to hey no all the stars are actually suns and bigger than suns and many 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 fold bigger than our sun to millions and billions of galaxies are there uh, you know uh, huge uh, solar system similar to ours are there maybe uh, planets are there which uh, which are habitable to to then we have talked about uh, you know the birth of a star death of a star black holes supernova so we have basically expanded our understanding over the last particularly in the last 200 uh, years and more so even in the 21st century of uh, you know understanding big bang with the gravitational waves and uh, you know uh, ability to track when two black holes collide uh, when two neutron stars collide so we you know if you just track the recent uh, uh, nobel uh, prizes given away you can sort of figure out how much of new information we have gathered right mm-hmm. but increasingly if i may just point out two things if you are talking about either the large hadron collider kind of a project or if you are talking about the instrument set up to measure gravitational waves or the james webb uh, telescope right they have become like multi billion dollar uh, multi country or you know even in this case it's predominantly it's a us project but uh, the rocket that sent it uh, was uh, uh, the uh, european uh, uh, space uh, rocket right mm-hmm. so and there are collaborations all over now or all future space explorations this expensive good question i am not able to fathom but i can point you at the ehd even horizon telescope right uh, right uh, that's not very expensive i mean it is uh, okay in the million dollar range but not the billion okay. dollar range uh, okay so probably i i think a disruption may be waiting to happen there in which okay. case you are able you know somehow you know you, you need to probably follow recarte a bit you know you have uh-huh. to be able to break down into smaller piece of observable uh, experimentable applying science and knowledge based uh, validation and verification units if you are able to do that uh, you may be able to scale it uh, differently uh, not i am not able to say cheaply but you know at least you can look at it differently <laughs> no, no no particularly because i wanted to see if small colleges and universities around the world particularly in india can they themselves contribute significantly because I, somehow you know i believe, you know, that, it, I believe it felt, that you know yeah because yeah. it's sort of slipping out of hand kind of a thing Correct. if i am a small rural college in uh, let's say somewhere kavalur. in rural tamil nadu for for example yeah. kavalur has an observatory because light pollution is right. very very low 
can they build right. something i believe so yes exactly i'm not even talking about the uh, you know isro type of or a indian government lab kind of a thing what can a small time college do what can a university do what can a madurai kamraj university do see uh, it's from from the kind of vision you know can i build with few tens of thousands of dollars to few millions of uh, dollars can i build something uh, even now to learn and and add uh, to the new knowledge so that that was that was a sort of uh, the reason to ask the question definitely uh, i'll come to another question which uh, madhu rao uh, is asking with the telescope seeing farther in time can we see the point of big bang at some time in the future and uh, he's another question which is what are some of the indirect benefits of uh, jwst project to science and technology like the internet was a by product of uh, cern hmm. uh, so this is this is uh, I, i can almost guess this is one of the madhu who has helped me in the uh, preparing this content uh, oh, okay. okay thank you madhu for the question so big uh, big bag again is a uh, it looks like you know uh, is one of the thought we had uh, similar to single solar system single galaxy and things like that you know it looks like even before big bang there were some stars and galaxies you know we may come to that kind of a potential reality if we you know is is definitely there i think you know uh, you'll be able to do but again you know the the, the challenge there is even in the current uh, information collection that we have uh, has it taken into account of the universe expanding you know we don't know the answer to that if you do the correction to that what will your theory look like we don't know the answer to that so mm, mm. i think you know these are deeper science question we need to deliberate with additional experiments observation and analysis uh, i'm not able to predict one way or the other so there the there is one bit that i can add the you know assuming that big bang was what actually uh, was the origin of this universe as we see there was a certain time horizon over which you know uh, nothing uh, that happened there even escaped right it's only after a particular point in time that Uh, uh you know light energy so many other things are all coming out so i don't know whether we can ever if if there indeed was a big bang that we can actually go back and observe that but we can observe it after that little uh, delta t uh, which is which is what you can see as or feel as gravitational waves and and, and such in a sense one may have to flip it i think let's say if there is a big bang what kind of evidences are you likely to get right right you have to look right. at it from that perspective you have to look at based right. on evidences that we can get rather than okay uh, building blocks theories or our favorite romantic ideas and things like that you know we need to move away from that then we may be able to right uh, okay uh, now uh, a step uh, Uh, down to uh, uh, you know what is um, uh, what would be more uh, meaningful to a lot of students right uh, if i am if if i want to pursue a career in this space uh, where do i start where do i go uh, one is you know if you are lucky and you get into some of the universities in the world which are doing cutting edge research in this then they will carry you through you know you just have to do a, a bachelor's in physics masters in physics and you land up uh, for doing either a masters or a phd in one of these great universities which are all part of all these programs so that's enough right but what if uh, uh, you know you don't have that kind of an opportunity right what mm-hmm. what am i supposed to read what am i supposed to follow where am i supposed to go so that i am at least aware of what is going on and i am up to date and uh, do a fair bit of 
research by myself because mm-hmm. i i don't have the kind of support that uh, uh, my institution is not you know uh, it's not going to provide mm-hmm. what are the possible so you know uh, i had looked at a video by prajwal sarsari one of the leading astrophysicists yeah. here he yeah. she had specifically uh, uh. addressed this you know she's she's definitely a stalwart she given some very interesting points you know is that you know are we able to practice physics and some of the fundamental sciences uh, uh. in your day to day life uh does it transform your life you know uh, not with the loaded uh, loaded idea of a transformation what she is saying is current education system is looking at uh, um, only matching the question and answer and they have a kind of competition to rank them based on that and because of that the actual people who are interested is not able to come up you know you are probably mm. peter principle is getting applied here you know if you are really good at it you won't be given that no <laughs> you will give some something else right so right. uh so can you know she is saying that there are a lot of astrophysics program you can go and join as an intern intern and you can figure out how do they do things the methodologies of uh practicing the astrophysics as a science will have to be proliferated there are some mm. uh, information available from nasa or esa or csa you may be able to pick up we in maybe in future something may be come up maybe india will have to look at like engineering they have to look at space program and space graduate more seriously you know what does it mean right. to you know, mean to do that you know that is likely to expand very well maybe we have to look at it more uh, just like the way we have uh, right or wrong we we put some energy into the engineering you know we need to mm. probably give it a push on the space so that a normal guy or a girl is mm. able to practice uh, astrophysics at home and i'm just loosely saying it you know Mm-hmm. Uh, in order to get that we may we are probably maybe 5 or 6 years 7 years from that but we need to get there it cannot look like any of the current educational program and it can definitely leverage some of the citizen science programs that are already there most of the uh, most of the space programs have a citizen science angle to it okay okay so uh, th- then there are a couple of other questions that i would like to uh, add to this if you are if you are serious about uh, so one is the you know if i am an amateur astronomer right my uh, fun stops with observing uh, things but, and then noting but the, them badri one minute my battery is low okay uh, i think we lost uh, Uh, okay uh are you back yeah, i'm not i think we lost him mm, badri uh, badri okay. one thing i want to add while we um, wait for him to connect okay back, let's wait for him to come back yeah. yeah one thing that i want to add see he was mentioning that around 40, 57 gb of data per day is uh, Uh, transferred by the telescope to base station okay so yeah ramana you want to come back and come on video uh... Uh, yeah okay so uh, what i what i want to point out is it is not just only going to be physics okay there is so much of data that we are collecting and someone has to use uh, a data science and artificial intelligence to process all this data and come out with uh, uh, conclusions uh, that help further the science right so that is also one area where people can look at it it need not just be uh, physics alone no no it's true i mean uh, in the in the very uh, early days of uh, uh, you know astronomy and uh, telescopic observation yeah you had uh, how you had these photographic plates yeah that needed to be processed and uh, 
so obviously you needed a certain type of technicians and uh, you know collecting uh, information there etc yeah uh, data scientists will certainly be useful as a, as helpers yes as helpers right yeah unless the data scientist knows uh, this complete field itself yeah you wouldn't know what to look out for otherwise yeah I mean, in right. in typical it terms domain knowledge is needed right um, absolutely you absolutely. have to build it on physics right your physics is the base there and you use data science to further your uh, uh, further your uh, knowledge or um, no, uh, learnings yeah marley is back yeah yeah sorry guys my yeah. battery went dead your yeah, battery <laughs> no problem just just couple of questions you know i will uh, we will end with this so uh, my uh, so for me the other question uh, was to uh, really uh, you know uh, when this james webb telescope picture started emerging there were you know even uh, you know every uh, uh, newspaper carried articles magazine carried articles articles written in tamil media but i'm not sure uh, that we have been able to give a sensible picture to our school students i'm coming one level further down amongst the students right now fundamentally to students again you have to start afresh students are really thrilled when you talk about black hole uh, you know time dilation uh, wormhole are still a lot more of the scientific uh, you know science fiction words which you know uh, i i don't really understand oh. whether they are uh, true or uh, not right so they're thrilled about it but explaining that isn't easy really right somewhere along the way to really understand them properly you need to understand uh, einstein's general theory of relativity and some degree of mathematics to really really uh, make sense of uh, what is happening in a star or what's happening uh, uh, at a certain level which means it is not you know beyond a point it is not a child's play right it has to be uh, advanced science and mathematics advanced mathematics without which you cannot really understand much of what is going on like take for example the uh, l1 l2 l3 l4 l5 that you mentioned right, right? how how at what level can we really bring lagrangian point to our students we were never taught this in my school True. i can follow the mathematics i then checked out it is not that difficult but why is it that we are not even talking about this lagrangian points in our regular school curriculum it may have to be celestial mechanics or something like that that is the one that may be talking about so we, we need to probably identify like you said the fundamental sciences that are prerequisite for this kind of uh, um, appreciation will have to be introduced at a early stage you are right brother if the, the school curriculum may have to be revisited for um, some of the scientific and understanding of uh, space tech is what i feel And that's right. where you are going right am i right yeah exactly exactly now without which your effort i mean we can't then jump to james webb telescope right when when we don't have the continuous understanding of how these uh, you know various stages of development has given us better and better uh, theoretical Control. understanding mm -hmm. with which we have got uh, better and better devices built collected better and better data and how that has in turn you know it is a cycle correct it's a virtuous cycle Absolutely. now ignoring all of that and suddenly saying you know i have these gold uh, uh, plated beryllium mirrors uh, in a honeycomb structure and i just sent it it just looks i uh, you know uh, and then it is collecting data and uh, 50 gb data has come and i have now this image which shows uh, uh, all these galaxies uh, looks like uh, you know just pure black box not able right. to connect correct right right you right. find it difficult to connect yeah 
absolutely so i think you know we really need to build that kind of a curriculum take it to school the school is not doing it i think as amateurs forum. as uh, mm-hmm. you know uh, like avara himera science forum or whatever it is we have to start putting together modules which a high school student can understand uh, you know tricky mathematics which you simplify to whatever level that you can then present it you know how do you calculate the geostationary orbit right mm. uh, or you know you have these gps so this is this is way way closer to earth right so yeah. you have to put these gps satellites what kind of uh, relativistic adjustments you have to make so that you get uh, you know time corrections and uh, you know uh, whatever uh, yeah. you know relativistic corrections that you have to make so mm. little things to really get people to start thinking about uh, you know these kinds of things uh, i know i i i really hope uh, somewhere we can come come together and uh, try to create that kind of a modules and then take them to uh, our children so definitely, i i know i just wanted to sort of touch upon no, that i can share not, not from the mathematical angle from the experience angle something i can share with you so at the time of jwp ours is a large family so all my uh, nephews and nieces at the time of launch itself i was very excited i would been okay. uh, pumping them with all the information they may not understand okay. but there is a overall okay. uh, enthusiasm about uh, what needs to be done why they know about jwsp what it is doing then they have this question why infrared is important uh, exactly right. why does it have to be sun shield you know Yes, um, and you know it has a it has to have a propellant, and that propellant will not have carburetors or engines. You know, you bring right. the propellant together, it's able to propel, right? So these right. are some of them are material science advanced, some of them are um, you know structural advanced. Each of them you have to put it together, make it happen. Um, you know, I shared some of the excitement. I think uh, the school system is. to bog down in some other direction padri so sir you know some excitement about what is happening uh, we need to probably bring in some more uh, forum and get to pe- get people to activate on this okay so we, we, in that no uh, you know we will we will really put something together you know i i you know i don't want us to generally keep talking like this after every such topic so let's put some you know let's uh, uh, come together create some material for uh, some sort of workshop that we can uh, present uh, you know from from the ancient times to the modern times what one can learn uh, from uh, this uh, you know the celestial uh, understanding you know how okay. how we can understand about ourselves let's put something together and uh, organize us uh, workshop so with that you know i i really enjoyed this uh, session i know there is so much more that uh, we could have talked about particularly the technology alone in terms of what does it mean Correct. to uh, you know build this telescope i mean Correct. what are even, the technological challenges correct uh, even why level, it is challenging yes engineering challenges right exact thing is a challenge right. and what all could have gone wrong or Absolutely. what is already going wrong is something going wrong how do we know how can we fix it so million mm-hmm. things that we can really talk about Contribute. but it's a good beginning and i'm really uh, glad that we had this uh, lecture and let's just uh, take it to the next step uh, as we go along uh, thank you thank you thanks you. a lot thanks thank you thank yeah. you and i thank you are feel free to yeah. uh, i'll share the presentation feel free to distribute it yeah yeah we will we will mm-hmm. share the presentation in our blog uh where uh, you have plenty of links which i found uh, really uh, uh, useful and uh, uh, fascinating and many people uh, can follow them you know after this uh, you know after they you would see the video they can go back and then select uh, many of the videos many of the links and get more uh, understanding uh, out of that yeah so maybe maybe thank you, maybe maybe some of the nasa formal formal education badri we can take it up look at it yeah. evaluate it shortlist and say sure. here is our 
formal education approach for understanding something or informal sure. whichever you know we can pick up anything you want sure thank you thank you uh, thank you all uh, thank you for all the listeners uh, who patiently listen to this and ask questions a wonderful session thank you uh, thank you once again murali and bye bye from uh, raimira sensor